Hey, good day, everybody. Time for another exciting episode of the OIG Roundtable. I always smile when I say it because I can never remember. Is it the OIG Roundtable? Is it the OIG Files? Is it, are we doing a LinkedIn Live? I always, I can never remember. Uh, but it is, it's the OIG Roundtable. The thing that always reminds me of that is when I'm joined by other people from the OIG. Today's OIG Roundtable is even more interesting. Uh, I've got, as you all uh, recognize, my two compadres, uh, partners in crime, Jason Eisengrind, retired special agent in charge from the OIG, retired and then went on to run uh, CMS's contract on the Medicaid integrity contract for 34 states, then went on to be the Western Unified Program Integrity Contract Director. And Matt Kachansky, also a member of the senior leadership special agent in charge as well, retired, went on to be the Northeast you pick director and the latest member of the advise uh, advisory team jim cox jim this is your uh, inaugural party uh jim uh i'm gonna let you introduce yourself in a minute but you know we're super excited to have you here as a member of the oig roundtable as a guest for this week's episode um but uh you know we're super excited to have you on not only just to have an introduction to you but because of your background and the fact that you really do provide a great compliment to the 360 degrees of best in class that we've got here at Advise. So Jim, I wanna turn it over to you. You are an OIG guy at heart. Uh, you are an OIG guy from New York, which is where Jason and I spent our careers, but I do wanna turn it over to you, Jim. Let's talk a little bit about your background, both OIG and then your post OIG time, which is equally as an imp uh, important piece and impressive. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jim. Please introduce yourself. Okay, thanks a lot, Eric. And uh, good morning to folks out there. Uh, I'm excited to be here as well, uh, joining uh, some folks that I used to know a long time ago. And uh, let me just give a little background about myself. I started as a, a regular old auditor in Albany, New York, and uh, progressed, uh, we call that Region 2, part of Region 2, and progressed up through the ranks. We eventually had offices in San Juan, Trenton, New York City, as well as Albany. At some point, uh, somebody liked me down in Washington, D.C., and uh, they asked me to apply for a couple of jobs, and I ended up uh, as the regional inspector general out in Region 5, based out of Chicago. Uh, the entire time at the OIG was wonderful. I met some fabulous people, including you know people on this podcast. Uh, Jason and I have uh, spoken over the last couple of months about the different cooperation that went on uh, amongst uh, people and some of the great times that we had. And uh, so I ended my career uh, out in Chicago as the Regional Inspector General responsible for the six northern Midwestern states looking for fraud, waste and abuse in the healthcare industry. Fast forward, uh, when I was out in Chicago, I was thinking I was moving and taking a promotion down to Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden, I got a call from New York State asking me if I would be the Medicaid Inspector General. And uh, that came as a surprise uh, to me and my coworkers. But quite honestly, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And I was out in Chicago. I was paying for an apartment out there. I would have had to pay for an apartment down in Washington, D.C. As you know, the OIG uh, wasn't going to fly me back and forth on the weekend. so. Uh, that was out of my own dime, and uh, so uh, I, as OMIG director, I'd be right here in uh, New York State, in Albany, and uh, living out of my house again with my wife, and every everybody was happy. So uh, transition to OMIG, I, I guess it was 23, almost 24 years with the federal government, OIG, and then uh, three and a half years with the state of New York as a Medicaid inspector general. Yeah, that's great. And for people that don't, you know, fully understand the interplay of the different operational divisions of the OIG, um, there's the Office of Investigations where Matt and Jason and I came from. We were the badge and guns. Then you've got the Office of Evaluation and Inspection. I always call those the uh, the social scientists, right? They do a lot of the empirical studies. And then, you know, Jim led the Office of Audit Services. Those are the people with the green shades and the abacuses, right? Those are the accountants. Most of the people that are 
um, working for the Office of Audit Services, have an accounting and finance background. Many of them are CPAs and have worked in public accounting. So, you know, Jim brings a different flavor to advise from the uh, fraud, waste, abuse and compliance piece, but from obviously the auditing and from that compliance piece as it shifted into OMIG. I want to focus today and talk a lot about New York State OMIG and, and particularly, um, you know, your time there and that interplay that exists. New York State OMIG uh, has been copied and mirrored in other states and other states have, you know, New York State has taken bits and pieces. For example, in New Jersey, uh, where I worked for a period of time, the OMIG was uh, ultimately the name of it was changed to the Medicaid Fraud Division, but the mission is kind of the same or similar. So, Jim, I want to uh, talk a little bit about, and, and Matt, I definitely want you to chime in because Matt, as the Northeast UPIC director, and Jason, as the Western UPIC director, there was a there was part of the mission of the UPICs and part of the requirements of the UPICs is some investigational work as it relates to Medicaid. And there's a huge amount of interplay that comes in between the UPICs and the Medicaid program. And, and Matt and Jim go back a number of years because Matt, uh, as the Northeast Regional Director for the Northeast UPIC, had to do uh, Medicaid investigations, which required uh, passing some of those cases on to uh, Medicaid. So Jim, talk a little bit about how that interplay works between auditors, investigators, the Mafuku, the UPIC. There's so many pieces of that puzzle that come into play. Sure. Yeah. And it, and it is very complicated, as is the whole healthcare industry, right? So uh, I want to just back up a step and go back to the OIG. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the major components, uh, Office of Evaluation and Inspections, Office of Investigations and Office of Audit Services. As uh, And I trained a lot of our new hire auditors. And uh, I had, you know, just a, a blast doing that. That was uh, the best time, to be honest with you, is watch these new hires progress through and, and get promoted up through the ranks. But uh, as uh, we taught folks on the audit side, we go out, we 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 develop an OIG work plan and we tell and provide our community what we intend to audit that year. And that's based on some political pressure or some uh, what you, hot topics that you read in the newspaper or whatever. Uh, and you pick up audit leads or, or you know, an auditor in uh, Albany, New York might find something that, hey, th this same situation might be occurring elsewhere. Let's see what's out there. But one of the uh, points I certainly wanted to get across today is when we I was with the Office of Audit Services, we taught people that if you're out there conducting an audit and you find fraud or you suspect fraud, the first thing you do is contact the Office of Investigations. Don't go any further because the last thing you want to do is mess up some investigation. So because of that policy that we had in place, I was able to work closely with the investigators throughout the year. I met some great friends, uh, you know, you folks right here, uh, as well as, you know, Anna and uh, uh, Mike, uh, you know, just tremendous people. And our offices were co-located. So basically, you just walk, you know, through the doorway and, and you start talking to folks and you say, hey, this is what I got. What do you think? Uh, sometimes, uh, on the investigative side, they would come to us and ask for our help, but a lot of times it was us just making sure that we weren't stepping on the toes of the investigators. Similarly, and just interrupt you and just interrupt you for one second. But so the 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 takeaway for me is that that interplay that you are already familiar with made going to the OMIG a super easy transition because you were already dealing with the various. Um, missions, the various uh, interplay that exists and goals and, and whatever else. So moving over to OMIG and having to deal with investigators and auditors and the Mafuku and the UPIC and all that, that was already part of uh, what was already ingrained in your in your core. Yeah, ex exactly right, Eric. And, uh, you know, Jason and I have talked about this, some of the best times that we had as auditors, or I certainly had as an individual working with OAS, is back in the days of Operation Restore Trust, when we worked side by side 
uh, with you know program folks. We work side by side with attorneys, investigators, uh, and, and folks from private industry as well, sharing information uh, and working together. That was a lot of fun. So that was also part of uh, my nature when I transitioned over to OMEG, right? So I had that as a background. One of the things I did at OMEG um, that I was uh, particularly proud of is I uh, transitioned, instead of having silos of investigators and auditors and data analytics, and attorneys, I, I went into a business line uh, way of thinking so that, you know, we didn't have enough staff to cover everything, but we had, you know, some attorneys that would overlap, uh, you know, say nursing homes and hospitals, right? That would be their specialty. But when I first got there, we had some problems with consistency throughout the state and how auditors were interpreting rules and regulations and the guidance that they were given to the community out there. Uh, and what I found was happening is even after audit reports were issued and finalized, uh, the attorneys would be, pair, pre, be preparing the auditors to go to trial. And I got thinking like, well, why don't we do that up front? Why are we waiting to the back end to you know, tell the auditor what they should be doing? So. Uh, that's something that, uh, again, I was proud of, and we got the auditors, investigators, uh, and attorneys all working together quite well. And, um, and then carry that forward, or even more so, uh, working closely with the Mafuka. Now, the, the Mafuka in New York State, they concentrate on fraud, whereas OMEG, we look for everything. You know, we conduct audits, we conduct investigations, but we did not have the uh, authority to prosecute. Right? If we found something that was fraudulent in nature and rose to the level of prosecution, similar to uh, OAS and the Office of Investigations, we would meet periodically with the Mafuku folks and say, hey, we have this, we have this, what do you think about this? So there was a somewhat open dialogue. Again, some great people at the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, uh, and we work closely uh, with those individuals. Nobody, and you guys know this from an investigative standpoint, you don't want a pile of crap handed to you, right? And just, oh, Jim Cox makes this allegation. Oh, lots of luck with that, you know? So uh, we, we had to make sure that we were thorough in our understanding of the issue, and, and it rose to the level that someone might be interested. And that reminds me of a conversation you guys had uh, last month, and that you know your audience, or you know uh, the U.S. attorney, what are they looking for, right? So that that's really important as well when you're talking, you know, New York State's Medicaid Pro. What is the right. uh, Mafuku looking for? Right. You know, and I think that that helps with you know not to make this a a conversation that makes it a sales pitch, but you know, one of the differentiators that I think we have is. The fact that we here at Advise have a really deep intrinsic knowledge of the way that these programs work. You know, our OIG experience is really, you know, second to none in our, our Medicaid related experience, you know, kind of helps to parlay that. Um, so, Matt, I want to turn it over to you because you not only would have, you know, obviously you interacted with Jim um, and Omeg and, and what have you. But what what did you always see as some of those challenges uh, not necessarily specifically with Jim, but that interplay and the challenges that exist in that interplay. Yeah, it was trying to figure out, because for us, for UPIC in New York, we had to get everything approved by the state, you know, subjects, uh, data projects, the methodologies, all the way through to here is the draft audit report or investigative summary to the final one. All of that had to go through an approval process with the state. I will say that in New York, they streamlined the process by giving us one point of contact, which was great. Instead of having to go to all the different entities, it was one person and then she would farm it out to whoever needed to see it. But where I ran into some problems was, you know, there were, I, th I believe that, you know, and you can, Jim, you can tell me whether I'm wrong or not, that the UPIC was seen as a resource but really not one that you guys relied on very much. It wasn't a priority for you guys to take a look at the work we were doing, 
and and get it approved and get it to the to the end product because we had a lot of things in the northeast you pick that were you know we had finished the audits we had done all the work and they were just sitting there waiting for approval and it just seemed like it was a, a priority issue yeah if if i could chime in here matt uh, you know let me start out by apologizing uh, because I feel responsible for that. But you're absolutely telling the truth. And a lot of that relates to staffing issue. And again, going back to that uh, that uh, point that I brought up before about some people not being um, kind of aware of the rules and regulations. And there was a lot of back and forth between, you know, uh, you folks and us, as well as we had a um, uh, some city uh, auditors that we're working with as as well yep. in the same situation. But most important, a lot of that comes back to staffing. I mean, yeah. when I started there in three and a half years, uh, my budget was cut by one third. One third. Oof. Went from 600. So, so Jim, I want to I, I want to jump in there because so we have conversations incessantly and we speak a lot in our podcasts about um, one of our kind of prevailing ongoing topics is why do cases take so long to get resolved? And, you know, that comes about as a result of people on social media always saying, why did it take four years for this provider to be adjudicated for this to, to result? And I think what you're getting to is part of what that problem is, is that there are limited resources. There were only so many investigators. There are way more cases. So, you know, it, Let's put that into its perspective, right? Because at the end of the day, it winds up just being the badlands, right? Like you've got all of these cases and you've only got a limited number of investigators and someone is going to get frozen out of being able to get that case adjudicated. So talk a little bit about the, the challenge of having a budget that is two thirds of what it had previously been. Right. So we went from, say, 640 employees when I started and it went down to 420 employees. So each, each of our units had to take a, a hit. Uh, we had 120 investigators, which seems like a lot of investigators, right? We had over 4,500 open cases, 4,500 open cases. So one of the things that uh, Anna and I did, uh, she was my deputy for uh, investigations and she, came over from uh, OIG as well. A tremendously smart, dedicated uh, woman. We had to look at the triage process, right? What was coming in, because it's easy to open up a file, but what we found is that nothing was being done because everything had to be touched periodically throughout you know, the year. And what, you know, it's like the shotgun approach, but nothing was being hit. And it was very frustrating to me. And I'm sure it was frustrating to the provider community. And it was certainly frustrating to our auditors. So we recognized fairly early on that we needed to, you know, do a better job on the triage on the front end. And would yeah, that's it. So that's a, that's a great point because you know what we hear a lot from our uh, from the SIU the special investigations community in the government in the commercial space and and I'm going to turn it over to Jason to talk a little about this in a second is exactly that is that if you're spending so much of your day just touching the case to do nothing but touch the case it never actually goes anywhere right and you know we're as New Yorkers and, and Matt has spent a lot of time in New York and New Jersey so he knows this you know. Yeah, we have a New York state of mind, right? Everything is constantly moving. We don't, if you're walking slow, please get out of the way, tourists. <laughs> Move to the inside of the street. We have places to go, things to do. And, you know, this isn't, you know, we're not, we're not on vacation. It's this constant, this constant motion. But so, Jason, I want to go to you because this really gets a lot into the operational stuff. But one of the things, Jim, that I recognized about Matt and Jason, having known them for a long time, but more so having worked with them here even more, is that Matt's real expertise is in process. 
right? So, you know, he's really a process improvement person and that kind of granular. And Jason's real uh, area of expertise, and these guys may debate and argue this, and, and but, you know, ultimately it's my podcast, so this is what I'm telling you. <laughs> um, but Jason is, is exceptionally good when it comes to like overall operational things, right? Like where do things need to fit and where does that puzzle piece go? And we talk quite often about the, the issue in resource allocation. So Jason, I, you know, when Jim is telling you that he lost a third of his budget and the volume of cases is going up, the budget's going down, that triaging that has to occur. And this is no different than at the OIG when we were duty agents and had to do those kind of things. But from that operational perspective, you know, how do you deal with the volume of cases that are ever increasing, constraints on budgets? And then particularly we throw in some of the discussions we've had previously on things like the major case coordination or the MCC and having to juggle resource allocation uh, with budget constraints, with mandates that come from both federal regulation and policy and statements of work. Well, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on a podcast with all of you, but definitely with Jim. I wish that I had spent even more time with Jim in my days at the OIG because while Jim was speaking glowingly about some good collaboration, which did occur, uh, what I really learned after my 30 years with uh, HHS uh, is that you can't really have enough collaboration with the different components because to, to bring it back to answering your question, Eric, is that you need to have that collaboration to maximize the resources that are going to get the job done. So if you try to just work it as an island, you're really going to get overwhelmed pretty quickly. The other thing, and I like the, the term triage, but I think triage, it has to be coupled with prioritization. So to, again, you know, where it's humanly impossible uh, to work 4,500 investigations with, you know, your staff being uh, cut by a third, uh, the, you can only save your mission by applying really good prioritization. In fact, again, not to sound like a sales pitch, but in the couple of engagements that I've been involved with so far, my short time here at Advise, it's, it's really been about explaining the need for prioritization and identifying the attributes that um, make an a vulnerability rise to the level of committing those precious resources. So that's definitely the answer to your question. But what I really wanted to ask Jim about also, because what I learned about um, the, the value of audit. So, okay, first audit and investigation. So those of us that are diagnosable investigators, you know, we probably have some warped view of what an audit does. Look, at the end of the day, both are there to gather facts that will result in saving the precious resources of our respective programs, um, mitigating fraud and abuse and waste where we can get to that as well. Now, the devil, though, is in the details. And the thing that I had to learn very quickly uh, was the, the need for generally accepted government audit standards, GAGAS, sometimes known as government auditing standards, GAS, or uh, the Yellow Book, uh, uh, which is a document uh, uh, maintained by uh, the, uh, the uh, General Accounting Office and or the Government Accountability Office now. So anyway, the, the point was is that the, when the Medicaid integrity contract started up, there was no GAGAS requirement. And after about a year, uh, CMS realized, you know what, we, you know, we're doing audits in this work. We need to be concerned with GAGAS. And so, Jim, could you speak a little bit about GAGAS, what it is, and, and just the value or the, the detail of it? Yeah, yes, absolutely, Jason. I, I've been a strong proponent of following GAGAS for a long time. Just generally speaking, it, it's, it is a yellow book. Literally, it's a yellow book. It's updated every few years. 
and um, it provides strong guidance to auditors and how they should conduct their business. And, but some of the uh, aspects of that yellow book that I find most interesting, they talk about the control environment and you know risks that are out there facing uh, different entities, et cetera. But my biggest concern uh, going forward now as we get um, post COVID days, uh, we used to go out on site and do audits, right? And one of the uh, aspects of the yellow book is to gain and understand what is that environment like when you're out there in that provider's community, right? And you don't get that. If you ask somebody to fax you documents or scan you documents and say, oh, you know, uh, su uh, supply us some support for this claim that you submitted. Okay, they do that. And, you know, who knows what it is these days? It could manufacture. I remember the first time when electronic medical records uh, was introduced. And, you know, I was looking at different files and everybody's name and date of birth was the same. You know, they just copy and paste it. But you're, the others today, if they're not out there finding out and getting a sense of what it's like, what is that environment like, that raises your, your risk level. You have some concerns what's going on. I can remember uh, many places going out and having my entrance conference, right? You always... You have to write to the provider, tell them you're coming, you have an entrance conference, and people sitting around the table. Two different places that I went to early on in my career, and no one was allowed to speak except for the ex uh, executive director of the agency. Now, what does that tell you? What kind of environment is that? Does that raise a little red flag in the back of your head? Absolutely, it does. So, you know, and the yellow book goes on and on about, you know, what uh, policies and procedures you should follow, but it helps with consistency throughout and make sure that it's thoroughly completed, right? Not just consistent, but you do the job that you should be doing. And uh, I, I'm a firm believer in following the yellow book. I always, uh, you know, ask that question when people I asked me to come in and consult with them. I'd say, well, what standards are you following? What is your audit policies and procedures? Because in order to be consistent, you have to follow the yellow book. Or there's, you know, AICPA has some published two uh, documents and some guidance for the uh, commercial world uh, out there. But when we're looking at government, government funded uh, uh, operations, there's not a better uh, guidance out there than the yellow book. So, you know, Jason, Jason put it a good way, and that's that's true. The, the devils are in the details, baby, right? The devils are in the details. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we think is important is obviously it's completeness and accuracy, right? That's a that's a big four methodology, right? We try to follow some of that completeness and accuracy when we're doing our uh, healthcare medical record reviews, right? We have a we have a document. We're, we're looking at everything in that document for that completeness and accuracy, whether it's on our provider side clients for compliance related work or, or on our SIU. But, you know, that's it's just an important piece of that. So, Jim, in the last few minutes we have, because we're running out of time, I do want to just switch gears uh, briefly um, and have you give some thoughts. So recently, New York State OMIG, uh, New York State OMIG came out with some new guidance and some new policy with respect to Medicaid managed care organizations within the state and has recently changed their rule that any, what we're gonna call an MMCO for Medicaid Managed Care Organization. And if that MMCO has an enrolled population, you can see my highlight on the screen of a thousand members or more in a given year, the MMCO will have a full-time SIU. And some of that staffing requirement is going to include uh, not just sufficient staff, but it's at least one full-time lead investigator and at least uh, and an, and an SIU director. One of the things that we've been seeing here at Advise is uh, on our SIU team, where we're providing SIU support partially or completely for about 15 or 20 different plans around the country. And that's growing in part as a result of this. Uh, we're very embedded in a lot of the New York Medicaid system uh, as a result of 
us coming from New York, but obviously there are going to be some financial uh, and some um, legal and clearly some other implications as far as the interplay that a plan that may not have had an SIU now needs to have. Um, you know, for us, we think that, you know, every payer plan out there should have some SIU of some sort, because even if you're a plan of a thousand people, there's going to be an unscrupulous provider that's out there that's seeking to parlay a winning strategy in a fraud, waste, or abuse uh, or compliance anomaly. And so when we saw that, we thought of that uh, in the sense that, you know, for us here at Advise, that's a plug and play. We have an analytics tool, we have a data analytics team, and we have an SIU team. We're plug and play, we're already in New York. And so I want to kind of close out and have you give us some final thoughts on where you see this regulatory guidance um, where do you see some of the challenges and where do you see some of the opportunities uh, in that? Yeah, again, thanks, Eric. So it's very interesting. Your state came out with some uh, new compliance regulations uh, not too long ago. And uh, besides the SIU, they're also beefing up the compliance program responsibilities, uh, you know, in terms of you know, hiring a full-time uh, compliance uh, director, forming a committee, and uh, updating it annually. And then those those compliance integrity programs extend to contractors as well. And you, you need some uh, verbiage in the contract that says you can be terminated if you don't follow uh, the, uh, and be able to certify that you have an effective compliance program. Uh, they also address these new regulations that an audit is required uh, at least annually of that organization, uh, which is very interesting. But I want to more specifically talk about, you know, the SIU component. And, you know, some of the challenges there is who are these people? What are the qualifications of these people? What's the learning curve? Um, what's the experience of these people coming in, trying to do the job? As we know, we, we've been in this business, uh, you know, uh, you know, in aggregate, probably been in the business 100 years, right? So we have a lot of experience just sitting around this table right uh, this morning. But it is very challenging to come in and understand wh what's going on out there. So, you know, if I was a Medicaid managed care organization, Absolutely, you want to fill that position. But in the meantime, you know, maybe you have to look elsewhere for help. Um, and the same thing, you know, uh, in conducting audits, you know, you internally you can do the audits, but to hire, you know, think about this the, these Medicaid requirements, it's they upped it from $500,000 uh, to a million dollars if you're receiving. So you receive a million dollars. Now all of a sudden you have to hire a full-time compliance officer. You have to have audits done. Well, you know, real quick, and you have to have a, uh, a compliance committee real quickly. You can eat up all, all your million dollars that you receive. Now, I look at it from a risk perspective too, right? Right. So if I'm spending all this money that the state is making me spend, how do I make that up? Well, you know, there's a lot of providers out there that are going to be looking elsewhere. OK, maybe we, you know, uh, we duplicate this billing or we don't provide the services. Um, you know, and I just want to touch on briefly because it, it's so near and dear to my heart. We talked about staffing before staffing at nursing homes, staffing at pharmacies. It's a big issue these days and uh, it just provides that opportunity and uh, increases the risk that there's an abusive behavior that's going to happen out there. And again, you know, I know what the state is trying to do. They're trying to put the onus on the providers to stop these improper payments up front or pass uh, to the SIUs. You know, you find it so we don't have to find it because we can't, you know, for we're cutting back on our staffing continuously. Um, but, you know, are they really the right people for the job? And I'm, uh, I would argue right. not necessarily so. So that, that's actually a good point. And, and to close out this conversation, you know, one of the things that we have found in speaking to some of these smaller plans that didn't have an SIU is 
they have no idea, right? They just have no idea. They've got this mandate that winds up being, to some regard, an unfunded mandate. And I know Jason and Matt can talk about unfunded mandates from their time at the UPIC. We can talk about our time at the OIG and unfunded mandates and sequestration and you know doing more with less, which I think is a great misnomer. You can't do more with less. You can maybe try to do the same with less, but you can't do more with less. You can only do more with more. And I think that one of the challenges that some of these very small SIUs around the state, and, and I, I do think um, not, you know, I'm putting on my, you know, my, my uh, Kreskin hat to, you know, read the future, but I can see, you know, New York State being a large state with a large Medicaid population, a big budget. I can see other states looking and saying, huh, maybe New York State's got something here because on a daily basis, we hear about the pro proliferation of fraud, waste and abuse and healthcare fraud within Medicaid programs. And, you know, maybe the time has come where something like this needs to be the thing because there has been no, you know, the fox has not even been watching the hen house. There's been no one watching it. But one of the things that we have learned in speaking to some of these plans that are coming on with us here at Advise is that they don't know what they're doing. And for them to try to figure it out, they're going to be so far behind the curve that it's not going to amount to anything for what they're for what they're spending. So I think that the, the resource issue is you're bringing up is, is it worth trying to hire all of these people? Uh, even if you've got people with experience, you know, there's a premium that comes with that. And, you know, having to do the yearly audits, an SIU director and then an SIU investigator, you're talking about potentially two or three people to come in and do something that, you know, that they maybe never done or, you know, the challenges of that. So I think that the landscape in New York is going to be really ch ever changing over the next few years. Um, these regulations that are out there, I think the the full document of what's been put out is, is close to 200 pages or so. So it's a it's a lengthy read. I know that um, I know that you've studied it, Jim, because we've talked a little bit about it and what those implications are. And those implications are going to have uh, audit, investigator, investigatory, and compliance related implications. So you know more to come on that. Um, so Jim, we're we're out of time. I want to give you the final. Uh, final word on this. So I just want to close this out with getting what is your prediction for where you see Medicaid fraud, waste and abuse uh, investigations, audits, you know, where 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 do the states need to make tectonic shifts to really curb what has become a uh, a huge problem in the Medicaid payment integrity system? Well, you know, my problem is that when you fund and you increase, and, in, you know, I've always said that my job was not to go out and find fraud, waste, and abuse as the Medicaid Inspector General. My job was to make sure that the funds were there down the road today, tomorrow, and 20 years from now for individuals that cannot afford health care to make sure that they receive health care. I still feel the same way today. But in order for that to happen, you know, we need to make sure that we have strong program integrity. This forcing people to hire an SIU is, are they just checking a box or are they actually requiring something, right? We talked before about what gets measured gets done, right? And what kind of who is looking at the work that these SIUs are doing, right? And, you know, are they coming up with, you know, uh, stopping payments or recovering payments on their own? That really has to be monitored as they shift the onus from state employees to basically, you know, policing yourselves out there. That's what they're doing. They're shifting it from state and federal employees to uh, police yourselves and let us know what's happening. Well, if nobody's sure. paying attention to that, it's a sad state of affairs. Yeah, no, and that's a and that's a great point, Jim, and, and I appreciate that. So we're out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Jim, of course, great to have you uh, here at Advise. 
Uh, I look forward to learning a lot from you. You've got a wealth of information that I know you are dying to share with everyone. So we're super excited to have you on here. Uh, to all of the people that get our newsletter and uh, enjoy this, uh, again, if you don't get our newsletter and you're watching this, feel free to send us an email at hello at advise, A-D-V-I-Z-E, health.com. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Just go onto YouTube and uh, type in Advise Health and you'll find all of our podcasts, both the uh, OIG files, our OIG roundtable, and also you can find recordings of our LinkedIn Live. Uh, we're going to be doing a whole bunch more of these. Matt and I will be doing a LinkedIn Live next week. We're going to be talking about my favorite topic um, and maybe Matt's, I don't know, podiatry fraud. Uh, we'll talk about the latest and greatest going on with that. So continue to tune in, continue to get our newsletter. We look forward, Jim, to having you on again in the future. And for those of you tuning in, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eric. See you guys.